buenos días, primero. Muy contento de estar aquí. Mi agradecimiento más profundo a los organizadores de esta conferencia Rosa Luxemburg. Es ya la Thank you very much to the organizers of the Rosa Luxemburg conference. It is a real pleasure to be here. El, Thank you very much. El, el tema que quiero abordar aquí, como saben, el tema de mi ponencia, el título es es, es un texto escrito por razones And de I'm going to be speaking ¿verdad? to you today no a hacer uh, about leídas, pero decadence of reason, hate, and lies. I had to prepare a written speech because it's being interpreted in so many languages. I prefer to speak off the cuff, but uh, for reasons of translation, el asalto al Capitolio. Be reading in this out. Washington, so the title is The Strategies of the New Right Extremism for the Conquest of Power. Now, the attack on the Capitol in Washington en on January 6, 2021, is a turning point in the history of modern democracy. There is a before and after. Aquí, ahora, vamos a analizar an analysis of the current symptoms of the democratic system shows this before and after. My contribution will take a closer look at the specific event that took place in a specific country, the United States, in, at the end of Republican President Donald Trump's term of office. Pero la lección de lo que vamos a decir aquí vale para otras naciones Y para otros contextos However, the conclusions that we can Europa, draw from this event ejemplo, also apply to other countries and Johnson, manifestations of populism Polonia in Europe. The UK, Kaczynski, Boris Johnson, in Poland, Jaroslav Kaczynski, Orban, Hungary, Italia Victor Orban, in Italy, Italy, Los Giorgio Meloni, and in the Netherlands. Gerd Wilders, Como de and these Latina, are just examples, as well as Brasil, in Latin Jair America, Bolsonaro, in Brazil, Salvador, Jair Bolsonaro, Bukele, in El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, de Javier in Argentina, Milley. Javier Millet, Asia, and even in ejemplo, Asia, for example, de Rodrigo Duterte, in the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, bon bon and Marcos Ferdinand Bongbong bon Marcos Jr. Estos casos que acabo de citar, in all of these cases, centro, the focus is leader, on a leader, un jefe, un guía. a el boss. De esta nueva it is the model derecha, of es Donald Trump, quien se a new como form un of right-wing extremism such as Don, Donald Trump, who presents himself as a charismatic leader, a, a messianic Unidos. leader chosen to Trump save the United States usa el poder de los símbolos, by manipulating the truth el and using highly symbolic representations, a base de una Trump dominates el y el the public space and convinces his followers through a direct relationship using social media comillas, del that his para government el is the quote-unquote government of the people for the people. Y las he Trump regularly denounces the establishment and political elites. He presents himself as a savior Trump who will restore the country. Simples, concretos, he uses simple, very specific, catchy slogans that are often Trump racist and chauvinist in nature. Cliché, por ejemplo, he uses dice, phrases and stereotypes quite cleverly let's make dice, America great again, or when he says, let's build the wall que sus against migration. Mantras, His fanatics repeat these like mantras, preventing any independent thinking or critical questioning of what's Trump being said. Desea ser un mito que el país Trump aspires to be a myth de narcissism 
that rules the country, shrouded in the halo of narcissism, idolatry, and public adoration. For example, he said, and I quote, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. And using shocking and confusing language of this kind, he manages to obscure truths dividing citizens into an us and a them, and inculcating an ideology of the end justifies the means. He has no qualms about inciting hate crimes. More than being a political leader, Trump behaves as if he were a prophet presenting himself as enlightened and chosen by God almost. He gets millions of people to subject themselves to him voluntarily, to accept his rule and to bend to his absolute will. Trump's followers have become a veritable cult that identifies with him passionately. His followers obey his words, they believe his stories, they are pursuing a cult of personality with him and essentially worship him. They're ready to take his orders and, if necessary, to embark on any adventure to ultimately keep their idol in power by force. As for the attack on Capitol Hill, and, uh, as for the attack on Capitol Hill, we need to examine the cultural realities behind it and seek an answer to the following questions. What did thousands of fanatical Trump supporters, what did these Trump supporters have in mind when they stormed the Capitol? What narratives were they working to serve? To what extent were social networks responsible? The main aim of my article is to find answers to these questions. At the same time, however, it's also about examining the global crisis of societies caused by the new disinformation system of social networks and looking at the effects that the increasing intellectual shift towards a cult of lies has on political governance. One of the main reasons for the weakening of democracy is the profound change in the way we communicate and consume information. In its, at its inception, the Internet generated a great deal of positive response to the new options for networking, communication, and organization. But this has shifted significantly. Even if searching for news on social networks for many is still like a window to the infinite ocean of the internet. But this window to the infinite ocean of the internet has dirty panes now and offers a distorted view of a reality characterized by fake news and manipulation. The information people consume leads to political polarization. One part of the people in the country are completely unaware of the other, and these are some of the negative effects resulting from the sudden connection of millions of people to an instant and permanent global flow of information. And our brains are not used to taking in and processing so much information so quickly. Many of us are suffering from cognitive overload. 
from this flood of information. And over time, we lose the ability to distinguish between fact, opinion, and pure fiction. The new information landscape or disinformation landscape would be more accurate is fueling some of the worst instincts of humanity. In some countries, this new disinformation system has created communities that can no longer distinguish between what is real and what is not. And none of this is going to get any better with the rapid development of artificial intelligence. The scourge of online fake news is undermining the very foundations of democracy. And at the risk of repeating myself, it can only get worse. As artificial intelligence becomes more sophisticated, everything will become much more complicated. This will make it increasingly difficult to detect falsehoods, fake news, conspiracy theories, manipulation, and disinformation. The global crisis of neoliberal capitalism, compounded by helplessness in the face of rapidly developing communication technologies, is leading to an unprecedented period of social instability, extreme polarization, and political uncertainty. Distrust of the ruling system and the frustrations of 40 years of ultra-liberalism is spreading. Many citizens, some on the right-wing spectrum as well, are looking for alternatives to the ruling system. The rise of the new far right is part of this climate of general discontent, which is also characterized by polarization the rise of hatred, social intolerance, conspiracy, manias, and discursive violence. Trump's paranoid verbal gaffes, his constant lies, fueled a very current political phenomenon, namely the extreme social polarization, the rise of intolerance, violent confrontation, and hatred in the prevailing discourse. Hatred has now spread throughout our society and can be fed, felt everywhere. It is no longer limited to one party or leader. Hatred is a powerful human emotion that is as blind and compulsive as love or fear, greed or envy. And the problem is exacerbated when a political leader a party or a government, some public figure who shapes the public debate, mobilizes this hatred against an ethnic minority, a social class, an ideology, or a particular person in order to dehumanize them, calling for their annihilation lynching or death, and this is the neo-fascist dimension of today's world. For the new right-wing extremism is once again using hatred as its most important instrument of political action. What happened in Washington on that Wednesday, January 6, 2021, <laughs> could happen again in other parts of the world in a different form, as we've already seen. In Rome, Ottawa, and Brasilia a year ago. 
I would like to warn you about this risk. Conspiracy theories are so widespread today that they affect everyone, regardless of their social class, intelligence, or level of education. So for many citizens, the question now is not what scientific evidence is there that this is the case, but rather, that's not what people are asking anymore. Rather, what they're asking is, why are they so insistent on convincing me that this is so? <laughs> so this is the main suspicion a kind of epistemological distrust that has spread through the networks in our societies, especially in the impoverished middle classes. Especialmente en las clases medias empobrecidas especially in the middle classes, which have been impoverished by 40 years of neoliberal policies, the most angry, desperate, and fanatical core of the voters of the new extreme right. It is as if we are witnessing an incredible reversal of Joseph Goebbels' famous prediction, which was that a lie only has to be repeated often enough and then it will become truth. Today, many conspiracy theorists believe that a truth repeated a thousand times is most likely a lie. And this represents, a, I mean, it used to be exactly the opposite way around, didn't it? You know, a lie repeated a thousand times becomes truth, and now the new extreme right are suggesting that a truth that is repeated a thousand times is likely a lie. So this is a sweeping difference in the history of communication. We could call it a Copernican revolution in the history of communication, in fact. And it also has to be said that all of this is taking place in the midst of a crisis of modern reason. And often as an individual and impetuous response to the overwhelming and ubiquitous dominance of technoscience. And yet science and technology in this context are unable to provide solutions to the most pressing problems facing the middle classes, such as unemployment, increasing impoverishment, forced evictions, insecure working conditions, social disadvantages, marginalization, and first and foremost, the threat of mobile of social losing their social position increasingly and falling down through the social ranks. And this is all the more true in that the new digital capitalism is imposing the Amazon model as the employment standard in the face of growing inequalities and the crisis of trade union organizations. And the myth of the self-employed entrepreneur and performance requirements as the new mandate of the postmodern working society leads to people submitting themselves to this pressure to perform 
and voluntarily submit to self-exploitation. As a result, people are in a constant war with themselves. They're hyperactive, exhausted, and depressed, and try to get through it all by using whatever tranquilizing means are at their disposal. Over the last 40 years, thousands of middle-class families have fallen into social poverty as a result of globalization. And even if some families have not yet experienced this fall into social poverty, the middle classes in the United States, Europe, Argentina, many other countries are well aware of this imminent threat to their children and their children. And they are very much afraid that their children and grandchildren will not achieve any social advancement <coughs> and will lose ground. And these people's trust in the post-war ideal of social advancement, which is very strong in Europe at least, has disappeared. And now they often feel they are losing their identity as well. Many feel that ethnic minorities, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, and immigrants are overprovided for in a manner they feel is unfair. And this sense of unease is exacerbated when they feel that the new waves of immigration from Africa, Asia, or Latin America might lead to further cuts in their own salaries. In his 2016 election campaign, Donald Trump pushed this identitarian, racist, and anti-immigrant narrative of the situation to the middle classes. In his speeches as a Republican candidate and in his tweets, he insulted Mexicans, Muslims, LGBTQ people, feminists, people with disabilities, and anyone who did not conform to his ideal of a white, male, hardworking, virile, successful, Christian, masculine society. He vehemently advocated the right to keep and bear arms, to have weapons. As a good populist, Trump perfectly well understood the discontent of the middle classes, the uprootedness and despair of an electorate that feels misunderstood, abandoned, and defenseless. And all of this actually managed to convince many poor white people that they were the victims of a great betrayal, of a huge lie. Just like Donald Trump had told them, everything that had happened to them was the result, he argued, of the infinite greed of castes organized in evil criminal structures in which the vultures of Washington allied themselves with the wolves of Wall Street. And he argued that the mass media were not defending them against these enemies, but rather were themselves the enemy of the people. The supporters of the new far right are the losers of austerity policies, people who have had to close their businesses in the face of ultra-liberalism, the supporters of the new far right are people who never go on vacation and who do not feel anyone is listening to them. And these impoverished, humiliated, uneducated white people, as they experience themselves fearful of the rise of immigration and ethnic minorities, Trump offered a kind of refuge of identity. 
For these impoverished masses and their fears, Trump developed a protectionist discourse against immigration, see the famous wall to Mexico, against Wall Street and against the media and the elites, like in Argentina as well. Contrary to Abraham Lincoln's warning, Trump believes that you can always fool all of the people all of the time. Thus, for Donald Trump, objective facts no longer have the same meaning. And post-factual truth has prevailed. This concept, as well as the terms alternative truth and fake news, are now widespread. Facts no longer matter. The statistics may be true, but they don't resonate with people. Many people are afraid. Many citizens feel they've been let down by their government. Sorry. Says the speaker, I had a little problem. And now, continuing on, 25 million Americans have slipped down from the middle classes. And Trump didn't just prove this with facts, but rather with feelings. The new leaders of the new right-wing extremism believe that facts no longer work, that you have to connect with people emotionally. And all of these phenomena have seriously confused the public, shaken by social disasters, frightened by the recent COVID-19 pandemic, and worried by the wars in Ukraine and in Gaza. Many middle-class citizens no longer have a sense of certainty, no longer have clear explanations for their own misfortunes. Nowadays, a sense of belonging to a group speaks more loudly than facts. On the social networks, we act as if we were listening to the fans of the opposing team while sitting with our own fans in a football stadium. In these social networks, we are connected with our own groups and seek the approval of like-minded people. We support our team by shouting at or insulting the fans of the other team. We are no longer looking for nuances, arguments, or tolerance. In these social networks, we're pursuing a logic of a head-on collision. A mindset of this kind is obviously extremely dangerous. It acts as a foundation for fanaticism and leads in various ways to aggression and hate crimes. Now, in the face of all of this, is there any room for optimism? Well, the attack on the Capitol failed. This is something we need to bear in mind. Democracy held firm. The victory of Democrat Joe Biden was officially announced in the elections. But social networks continue to spread lies, hoaxes, and conspiracy theories 24-7. The cultural civil war is being waged more intensely than ever. In the United States, Republican voters continue to not recognize Biden's victory for the most part, and they have not changed their attitude. And despite his failed coup attempt, Donald Trump is not backing down and is threatening to return to power. 
And that's why we all need to engage in this debate. It is a duty, an obligation, not just to counter these arguments, but to battle the ideas of the far right wherever we can, and we must prevail. Thank you. Gracias, querida.